Good morning and welcome to Celebration Community Church. Good morning. Are you ready to go this morning? Yes. My prayer this morning as we were praying before church was, Lord, put us in the right mind frame as we walk through the door. Let us forget about what we have to do this afternoon. Let us forget about what we have to do this week. Let us forget about all those things that distract us from being with the Lord this morning. My prayer this morning is that as you come through the door, that you would give your time to God. That you would just focus on Him this morning because He is worthy. Amen? Amen. He is so worthy to receive our praises. He is so worthy of all the accolades that we could ever give to Him. So let's start off this morning by just getting in that right mind attitude this morning. Lord, we come before you this morning. We just thank you. Father God, for who you are. We thank you for all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. And Lord, let us focus on you this morning. Let us get in that mind frame of we're here for you and we're going to give you our all this morning. Lord, we just submit ourselves to you. And I had this image of us kneeling before our Lord and our Savior this morning saying, Lord, just take all I have, all I can give for you. And I offer it up to you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise Amen. The Lord. John chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Amen. Amen.
Psalm 133. Behold, how good, right? Say it with me. Some of you know it by heart. How good and how pleasant it is, right, for brethren to dwell together in unity. And it says, for there the Lord commands the blessing. Life forevermore. It is so important for us as the body of Christ to stay united. You know, I'm sure that the Christians that grew up in communist Russia, those real Christians, they didn't let communism, they didn't let their form of government separate them in the bonds of love. I'm sure some of those Christians that grew up in socialist countries, those real Christians, they didn't let their form of government separate their love for their God and for each other. So why in the world would Americans let our democracy separate us? First and foremost, before we're Americans, we are Christian Americans. Do you understand what I'm saying? And where the blessing is, it's in the unity that we have one with another, right? There's no greater love than to lay down your life for one's friend. We're to love first, even in differences of opinion. Everybody hearing me?
dividing walls. In the name of your son, we will break dividing walls. We will break dividing walls. And we will be one. Oh, we will be one. Yes, we will be one. God, forgive us for all the places where we harbor division divisiveness and strife in our heart where we contribute God to a rift in your body and in the bride and setting up building it up. Lord God give us a standing coming and a spirit Lord of self control to control our tongues, to control our thoughts and Lord to be that oil that flows down on the beard of Aaron where you bring unity, you see unity. Lord God pour out your blessings. I ask that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We need you. Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. I sing praises to your name. Praises to your name, O oh Lord, for your name is great.
sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. I just thank you for this day. I just thank you for an opportunity to share your word. I thank you, Lord, for the brain you gave me. I thank you, God, for the heart you gave me. I thank you, Lord, for the giftings you gave me, both in the natural and the spiritual. But Holy Spirit, I pray for the unction to preach this word under your anointing. Lord, I pray that in Jesus' name. And God, that you would direct my words, you would direct my thoughts, and you would get glory in this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now listen, um, <clears throat> I've been, I'm, I'm very busy. So I'm fulfilling some of the roles here in celebration. So I'm the 
the worship leader. Desperately need some help here, but I'm here every week. And I'm fulfilling that role and, and helping out with teaching and the elders meeting and stuff. But I also am actively fulfilling my role as the missions pastor with lifted hands. And so, you know, a couple times a week, Tuesdays I'm here early. I'm teaching at BSM online. BSM is, is open and still going on. Uh, Wednesday nights I actually sleep here, believe it or not. I sleep here because I have to be online so early. You know, somewhere uh, between, it works out 4.30 and 5 in the morning. I'm online uh, sharing a message with Pastor Sasha, translating. And what I'm doing is I'm helping him with an online school he's putting together. And uh, so he gave me the topic of going through the epistle of James. And I'm going to share part of that, uh, just one of the sessions there. For those of you who are interested... Uh, this school, I think, is going to kick off on Thursday. Now, it'll be <clears throat> 7.30 German time. But those of you who are available or interested and you've got sl some time at 1.30 in the afternoon on Thursdays, you can join in. If you're interested, I, I can send you the link where you can join in and participate uh, with believers from Germany, from Norway, from other places in Europe. It is taught in English and translated into Russian. And uh, so I'm putting a little plug in there. If you can't join in on one thir at 1.30, you know, it's just not possible. They will be put on YouTube and you can go back and go through the whole study. And uh, we recorded session six uh, this past Thursday and we're not even through chapter one yet. So it's pretty, we're, we're going into a lot of detail. So Lord, help me. Let me give you a little, little bit of summary about this epistle before I get to the section I really want to talk to. So James, the writer of this epistle, is the half-brother of Jesus. He became one of the foremost leaders in the, the church of Jerusalem. And interestingly enough, when Jesus was alive, walking and talking and living life on this planet, James was not a believer. In fact, he was a skeptic along with his other family, his other brothers. But something happened in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And James is one of a few people where Jesus actually went on his own and met with him. Now, nobody knows what was said to James, but the result was is James becomes a believer. He's in the upper room in the beginning of Acts when the, the gift of the Holy Spirit was initially given. And he rises up to become the leader in the church of Jerusalem. And this is probably, most, most probably the very first book of the New Testament that's ever written. It's not in order, you know, we open up our New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that's not chronological. This was actually the first epistle written in the New Testament. More than likely, most scholars completely believe that. Now, James was writing to a group of Jewish believers. This is before the influx of Gentile believers. This is before the Spirit fell and the Gentiles came to Christ. So he's talking to, he's writing a letter to Jewish believers who had been kicked out of their home. They've been dispersed. They are so persecuted that they have to leave their home. They are alienated not only by the Romans, but by the Jews. Because now they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And they're dispersed, interesting enough, and it probably stunk for them. They probably questioned so much about, wow, if Jesus is Messiah and I'm a follower, why am I being persecuted and dispersed? into all these different countries that happen to be Gentile countries. I guess I don't have to say too much for those of you who are actually listening and thinking because that dispersion led ultimately to the turning of the Gentiles. But this is a people dispersed, homeless, alienated, and persecuted because of their beliefs. And I don't think there's anyone in this room who has any idea what that's like. We may be entering a time in America where we start to experience more and more persecution just because of our faith. 
And if you go back and you listen to my teachings, you'll see I have said time and time and time again to all of you that it was time to really know your Bibles and to prepare yourself for a time like that. And it may very well, we may be at the doorstep of a time where just because you're a Christian, you're looked down upon. And you better be ready. And so James writes this letter to these people. And it's interesting. This is where it's a great letter. It's only five chapters it's short, but he says, Count it all a joy when you fall into trials. Count it all a joy. Interesting, isn't it? Now, I love the phrase fall into because what it's telling us or telling me is that, look, nobody sees a hole and purposely falls into it. It's something they stumble into by accident. And what, Paul, uh, what James was writing about and, and speaking to the people about first was that there's trials that you're going to fall into and it's not your fault. These are trials that come from the outside of you, from outside sources. Not your fault, but you should still count it a joy. Remember, what the enemy means for harm, God can use for good. God is your God. Jesus is your Lord, all-powerful creator of the universe. Do you believe it? Later on, then he moves and he says, endure temptations, trials, temptations. By the way, it's the same Greek word. Just a different aspect. And James turns the page and turns the focus, and now he's talking about these inner struggles, inner moral struggles. The, you know, the things that start to come to the surface of our life when we're in trials and in temptations, no matter how long we've been walking with the Lord. Ungodly desires, traits in our character. And the enemy has a specific plan in all this. He points it out. There's, first he gets you to entertain an ungodly desire. Then he leads you to a point of being deceived. Then he gets you to act in disobedience. And then it says he brings you to spiritual death. And he doesn't stop there. He goes on, and this is all chapter 1. He says, in these struggles, you need to focus on God's goodness and the fact that he's a constant giver of good. His goodness right now is flowing down. There's no blockage. It's a, he's a constant giver. He says, look, in all these hard things, these annoying things, these things that get you all... Mm. Now, James says, look, in these times of outside trials, in inner turmoil, where temptation, and you know what? You're thinking the wrong thing. You know it when you're thinking the wrong thing. Some of us, don't you feel dirty? Ugh, sometimes it shocks us. I can't believe I just had that thought. You get so frustrated, and you just want to go off on a, a rant that uses every dirty word in the book. It's right there. Those words are in your head. They're right there, ready to come out. And he says, listen, here, here's some key. You've got to get your reality right and focus on good, God's goodness. And then it says, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. I don't know. I spend hardly any time on Facebook. I spend very little, you know, I have to walk away. I, I'm just being honest with you. Wayne's, I've told Wayne several times. I'm like, don't tell me, don't, don't tell me right now. I'm walking away. I don't want to hear it. Because if you don't, if you aren't quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, the righteousness of God will not be produced in you. So if you want the righteousness of God produced in you, you need to learn self-control, not to get angry first, not to open your mouth, and not to listen last. Sounds simple. 
but you're going to have to work at it. So now, let's get to the heart of what I want to talk about today. James 1, verse 21. It says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Now, James is writing to people who are being severely persecuted. They've been dispersed. They've been kicked out of their homes. And James doesn't talk about the Romans. He doesn't talk about the unbelieving Jews. He doesn't talk about any of the external. He says to them, yes, you are in a bad way. But quit your complaining, count it a joy, and remember, look inside. What is being produced in you? And it says there's all this filthiness, all this overflow of wickedness. We're not talking about just little baby Christians. We're talking about adults here. And it says, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. James is trying to get them to have a paradox shift in the way they think, in the way they see. What the enemy means for harm, God uses for good. Now, we know the verse, right? As silver tried in the furnace seven times. This idea of purifying precious metals in a hot furnace. And we know what the byproduct is of that process, right? What is it? When you refine precious metals in a furnace, what is the byproduct? No, that's not a byproduct. That's what you want. Dross. Dross. In that process, something gets produced. See, in the process of being purified, something ugly is produced as well. And... This dross, this impure waste material, it rises to the surface for the intended purpose of being scooped out. Like silver tried in a furnace seven times. Let's look at this verse. It's Psalm 12, 6. It says, the words of the Lord are pure words like silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Now, in Genesis, we know... Uh, what we're made of. Anybody know what we're made of? Dust. Right? Dust we came and of dust we will return. We're made of clay. And when you read that verse, you have to understand you are the furnace. You are the furnace in which God puts his word through a variety of ways, through the preaching and through your obedience to be Bible students, hopefully to become Bible scholars. In all the fiery trials, all these inner temptations, they, listen to me, yes, they produce dross, but for the one who keeps their eyes on God, the only purpose of those fires, it can only serve to increase your purity of character. How frustrating it must be to the devil when he encounters a believer who's so bent on being faithful to God to keep his eyes fixed on Jesus. James is saying, don't be discouraged of the dross. Don't be discouraged when you go through these trials and you see this stuff, you think this stuff, and it's in there and you're, sometimes it just shocks you. How many of you have ever had this thought after walking with the Lord so long and then you get encountered this thing and you're like, I'm just so surprised. I don't mean the DF bomb. I'm just so surprised that that popped into my head. I'm so surprised that, you know, today I got so aggravated here that I came home and I demanded everybody else and I had nothing to do with it. Have you ever been shocked at the ugliness? You think you should be done with it, and there it is, rising. And he says, don't be discouraged, but it says, lay it aside. 
You have to be diligent. In fact, it's so much forceful than that when you look at the Greek. It's more like cast it aside. When you see it, you have to identify it, confess it, grab it, and throw it as far away with you with intention. I want you to imagine an Olympic shot putter. How much is a shot? I think it's like 12 pounds. 16 pounds. Shot. You ever seen? You, come on, you watch the Olympics, right? You ever watch? And throw in the shot past himself. He uses all his strength to throw the heavy weight away. That's the diligence. That's the mindset. That's the effort we have to deal with when we find the dross coming to the top. Not lazy. I learned a, my favorite a Lafian word this a uh, couple weeks ago in teaching my students, and I talked to them like this too. It's schluden. It means lazy. Don't be schluden. Right? With the Olympic shot putter, the farther he throws it away, the bigger the reward. The one who throws the shot the farthest away is the one who receives the gold medal. And what is this dross that you're throwing away? Honestly, you're casting aside what you were. What you were. The residue of what you were. Your new creations in Christ, but yet we know that the flesh still rises up. And when you see the flesh, it's like cutting the fat off a nice piece of steak. Out of way. It's the identity you created before Christ. With all its corruption, the bad care, why do you cast it away? So you can receive something better. And you have to set it aside. Is everyone with me? You're listening. You must understand, you must cast it aside to be able to receive. I go to a lot of churches all around the world. I've been in this church. And you know what? Sometimes there's people in churches that five years can go by, ten years can go by, and they're in the same exact place they were. Dealing with the same kind of situation, same kind of circumstances. You can see that they didn't grow. There's not too much casting aside, genuine casting aside, to receive something better. It's so important to be an active, living disciple of Christ in doing what the Bible says. Empty your hands to be ready to receive. And the verse says, receive with meekness. And what that means is first, you have to receive with humility. Because what you're receiving is something that must be given to you. You can't, contain, you can't uh, apprehend it, take hold of it of your own. It's something that must be given to you by someone greater than you. Is everyone with me? In fact, the receiving word actually also means accepting. You need to accept it. Humbly, willingly accept it. What's a good measure if you're a willing acceptor? Are you teachable? Or are you a debater? Are you one who automatically goes to a defense when confronted with something that's talking about your personality Maybe some filthiness, some wickedness, some dross. Are you willing to be taught? Are you teachable? Are you able to humbly accept without resistance, without disputing, without questioning the Lord? I don't know how I'm not too many military guys here, but I know my buddy Larry House will tell you that, you know, being in the military. They teach you to say yes and yes, sir. Because they've been taught that in a time of war and in battle, there is no time for asking for an explanation and for question. It just leads to death. I'm not telling you not to be thinkers and not to have, be able to dialogue with the Lord, but you have to face the mirror and see if you really are an obedient or an excuse-making disobedient disciple. That's up to you. And what is it that you're receiving? It says, receive the implanted, or another way it's translated, the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. 
the engrafted logos, which is able to sozo your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. Sozo is also the word for life. It's translated life. And James is using a word related to gardening. You know, all the Leebacks here, they're like, I got this. This is a day made for me. And really, this, is, this, this word engrafting, being engrafted, it's a, it's a gardening word. And James is directing us to clear the fields, clear your lives of the weeds, and let the master gardener engraft you with the divine. Now, how many want to be engrafted with the divine. Amen? Amen? Then you need to cast aside. You need to be a diligent. Your part is being diligent to cast aside all the dross that gets produced in this season of your life. And that's your part. If you're diligent to look at yourself clearly and deal with and cast aside the dross, then you get back. Something that's divine. Look, I want to read a couple verses out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Because Paul is expressing the same kind of thought here. It says, therefore, this is verses 1 and 2, 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. He's talking about, ooh, I identify things that I'm shameful about. Casting the things that are shameful in exchange to what? The manifestation of truth and keeping your motives pure. This is an exercise I want to tell you, tr take this week. If you, if you are really listening and you really want to grow, then do this. I give you a homework assignment. Manage your life this week. All the decisions you make, all the things you do, and ask yourself, what was the motive behind it? Every time you have an exchange with your spouse or a coworker, and you make a request or you get frustrated, ask yourself, what was the motive in your heart there? Was it self-centered? Was it for self-interest? Does it line up with something that's pure and good and right? Go ahead. If those of you who are courageous and want to grow, you'll do that. And you'll be willing. Blesses is a man who can endure, you know, discipline. Don't be a Christian who's lost the ability to be disciplined. For those that cannot be dis disciplined by the Lord are not disciplined Christians. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 to 10. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We are the earthen vessels. That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Do we understand? We're the earthen. We're the fragile thing. And God puts the divine in us. And that's the power. Really. It's such a balance to walk in understanding that we have such power in us to live right, yet we are so frail and so low. It says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body, you want Jesus manifested in you, then there has to be death in you. Daily, dying to the flesh and coming alive. In the power of the resurrected Jesus. Now let's move on. James, verse 22. Are you ready? I love you. I hope you understand. You are my passion. Do you understand that? Paul, I, you know, so as I age in what I do, as I age in age, I understand so much more of Paul's comments. When he talks about, you are my crown, you know, he sowed so much. James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. 
So we cast away the dross, the impurities. In other words, we stop being doers of things so that we can become doers of good. Before receiving, before having the word engrafted into our lives, we were already doers just of the wrong stuff. Amen? Now, this word doers, man, ugh, this is, this is, God showed me something here. The word translated doers is so interesting. It specifically means a performer, and more specifically, it means a poet. What's that mean? Essentially, what James is telling all of us is to perform your new script. Savannah knows what I'm talking about. Those of us who have been in productions. <laughs> what James is saying, you now have a new script. Perform your new script. Live the God story. Live the word. God's script for life. And what he's saying is like, look, I'm engrafting you with the word, this good and powerful thing. And, he, and honestly, he's saying as you go out into the world, realize I'm putting you on a stage. And you are to become the voice, the sound, whether it's in word or deed, so others hear the story. Do you understand? Somebody more than likely was perfect the story in front of you leading you into the Lord and, God, and James is here he's saying look perform new script become the voice become the sound so others hear your Christianity is not about you getting it's really about you giving the same thing I gave you life and what James is saying is do it do it! And remember, he is writing this to a persecuted, homeless, alienated people. Wow, James. Wow, James. Maybe, you know, can't you find him a home? You know, come on, James. You know, can't you get him out of their troubles? James not once talks about, let me get you out of your troubles. He's saying, See what's being ultimately produced in your life in these things. Now, you know, many people sit in church, listen to a message, and I expect to hear some amens, and totally forget what they just heard by the time they get into their cars to drive home. And why? My opinion, they have no intention to respond. And what I mean by that, they're not going to church with the intention of really, this anticipation of getting something to respond to. I wonder how many lives would be transformed if we went to our services with the thought, wow, I wonder what God will say to me today through the message. I hope that God's saying something to you. Imagine if you went to church we came to church with this. I wonder what God will direct or ask of me to do today. Imagine if you're driving here. You're walking up the steps and you're going, you're talking to the Lord. I wonder what you're, how you're going to challenge me today. Not with the idea of like, oh, I wonder what I can get. Exposure to COVID-19, to the virus, may make you ill. Right? But just being exposed to teaching and church does not keep you in right relationship with God. Just being exposed to a message, just being, you know, exposed to church doesn't guarantee you anything. It's in the intention of your heart. It's in the intention your determination to actually receive something and do something with it, to hear and to do. 
And we could see that there's a pretty big exodus, just look around our church, of young people today who were raised in church and now living apart from God. Being exposed is no guarantee. Each person, I hope everybody's listening to me, are you intending? Are you being intentional? Jesus referred to the word as nourishment. Remember when the devil was tempting him? And the, he said, you know, make these stones into bread. And Jesus responded, I have food that nobody really knows about from my father. The word. Right? <laughs> he refers to the word like food. Now I'm laughing because I don't want to offend anybody. Right? We consume food. Why? To give us energy to live and move. Right? We consume God's word, hopefully, to live and move and have our being. Right? Now, a glutton, a glutton is someone who loves food but hates to move. Now, they may not say, oh, I hate to move or I hate, but just the fact of their non-movement relays where they're really at. A glutton is someone who loves food but hates to move. And you know what? They end up in critical care. We could go to hospitals all over New Jersey, and what you're going to find is so many of the people in critical care are people not even very old, but who are extremely overweight. I understand that some people have thyroid problems, and there's some that have, you know, issues that you know are, are legitimate. And need to, they need help, but some of them just ate their way. And when you just become a consumer but not a doer, spiritually speaking, I mean, that's a question. Don't, don't you like these kind of questions? Go look yourself in the face in the mirror and say, God, am I just a glutton of your word? I just like hearing a good message and not doing anything with it. What you're getting today is supposed to energize you and nourish you to be a doer. We are to live by faith. All right, I'm almost done. It's not even 1130. Everybody okay? Yeah. James 1, verse 23 to 25. If anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one, this one will be blessed in what he does. Now, how many of you have your smartphones? I'm going to tell you something that not too many. Well, take out your smartphone. If you got your smartphone, let's just do have a little. And open up your camera. You got your smartphone, let's just do this. Open up your camera and make it the camera looking at you. And let's all have fun and let's just click a selfie. Now, click on the picture. You see the picture? Now, how stinking ridiculous. How absolutely moronic would it be if you now are looking at that picture and you're like, who is this person? Who is this? I mean, how ridiculous would that be? It would be ridiculous. Come on. Wouldn't that be ridiculous? I'm not talking about a picture you pull out of the bottom of some plastic crate that you hit up in your attic that shows you at 15 when you're like, you know, 50, 60 some years old and you show to someone and they're like, who is that? <laughs> and you're like, thanks, I did used to be good looking. <laughs> Isn't it just as ridiculous to receive God's word and not put it into practice? Now here's an appropriate question. Remember, I love you. 
But everybody repeat after me. M. I. A. Hypocrite. See, we are hypocritical when we say one thing and yet do another. Am I a hypocrite? I look out and you want to know I see, I see. I don't just see the army of God. I see the, the elite secret service of the Lord's kingdom, right? Those that have no fear of death. Those that have there's no command that they're not willing to fulfill. Greater man has no, a greater love has no man than this to lay down his life for his friends. Be doers. I'm going to end now. I have some more, but I'd, I'd invite you to read James 1, 21 through 25. And I, I just, I want to put this forth to challenge you. Don't you want to grow? Your opportunity tomorrow to shine brighter than ever before is, is there for you. What are you intending? What's your intentions for your life? My intention is in my dying day to have been able to look back and say, God, I gave it all. And everything that I did, everything that I do, you know, is, is lined up with your purpose. Not some selfish pursuit. I want to be the kind of person, don't you? It's more focused on others than your own needs. Who wants to be one who's willing to stoop low to help a brother or someone off the ground? This is... The call of God on your life is a call to diligence. Don't let this time, this season be one. I know you're in your homes and think we're not as free. That doesn't mean your faith can't be active and you can't be taking advantage of the time to better prepare and deal with the, deal with the dross and receive the divine. Father, I thank you, God, that your word it divides right from wrong. It's, you're what we need and your word is our script. And I pray, God, for the encouragement of your Holy Spirit to fall upon us all, to make sure that we are walking the path, that we are keeping in step with you, not ahead, not behind, but with you. I pray, God, for those that have fallen short and fallen away from their prayer time and their, their study of your word and their seeking of you the God that you would resurrect that. I thank you that your mercy is new every morning and your grace is sufficient for us in all things. God, that you would help us to really see, really hear, really understand and to make the most for the kingdom in this season. God, we pray for our country. We cry out for it, God. We beseech you on behalf of this country that God, that your word would be the guiding word, that you would, Father God, speak to the hearts and minds of all of our leaders and give them supernatural wisdom to continue to, to, to bring this country back on track with things that line up with your word. And you lead us in the tomorrows, but whatever God, that we would find our security in you. I bind those spirits of anxiety, and worry, and fear. In Jesus' name, I cast you aside away from these people. And I speak health over their physical bodies, over their emotional health, and over their spiritual health. I pray blessings on celebration 
I thank you, Lord God, for all the opportunities we have to shine light. I thank you for Pastor Wing and the efforts he's made and the relationships he's built. And I pray, God, to let it be a season of fruit. Even as we enter into the fall and the natural, God, that fruit would begin to blossom. God, help us to be welcoming of the sick, of the confused, of the deceased. Lord, help us to be welcoming of those that are immoral. The Father, that they could come here and feel loved and find truth, find healing, find deliverance, and join the bride. And Father, keep the most important, the most important. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.